So it's mid-April now, I'm back down the club lake and I've got 36 hours ahead of me. Welcome to vlog number five. Okay, so welcome to the next vlog. Thank you if you watched the last one. Um, got some really good feedback from that. And the photography tips seem to be a really good little section to have within the vlog. So I'll be doing that again in this one. Um, a lot of people were asking about self-take photography. So, well, self-takes and mobile phones. So that's something I'll be focusing on during this vlog, but I won't be doing that during this session. I'll be going down to a little lake nearby as well uh, later in the vlog after I've done this session not after but later in the video and uh, that way I'll hopefully I'll have a few bites so I can show you little bits and pieces throughout the day um, so like I say we'll we show you how to get kind of the best images from from using your phone uh, I've got a little little phone tripod and everything is to be honest it's not something that I've really done so I don't obviously I've got camera kit so I don't really use my phone that much but I know it's quite important to a lot of you so hopefully with, uh, with the kit that I've got, I'll be able to show you how to get the best images from your phone, but I'll be doing some self-takes on cameras as well. So I'll be running through, again, equipment. Um, the editing process is very similar to, to how I showed in the last video about the landscape photography. Most editing is very similar. So once you've got that nailed, then uh, that, that carries through different aspects of, of photography as well. So we'll see how it goes. I might show a little bit of the editing process of of cat shots as well but like I say it will be very similar so let's see see how it goes and go from there but I've just got down to the club lake again um, I got down here about half ten this morning so probably the worst time really to to try and see fish but I've I've located myself in, in this swim here and this is down the far end of the lake towards the deeper water it looks really inviting actually there's wind pushing in which is actually a fresh wind I was down here yesterday doing a product review and the wind was piling down the other end so I'm thinking a, a change a change in wind, a, a fresh wind, the fish might get on it and sun's beaming down in here as well and these margins just, just look really inviting so I'm going to get the, the middle rod out first which I'm going to be using the bushwhacker I'm going basically it drops off quite gradually and then it, it drops to a point of about 12 foot so I'm going to be hitting that with the, the middle rod with the bushwhacker and then either side of the swim the margins are, are really um, they look like they could actually be quite productive so I'm going to try and actually weigh the bait out place it in on both sides so let's see how it goes let's get the first rod out so bait wise I'm using a combination of the Escore original which I've uh, I've kind of ground up so there's some whole 10 mil boilies there's little chops there's some um almost like oh it's pretty much like dust just for attraction so i'm hoping that's just going to spread amongst the area and keep fish grabbing for a while so i'm using a combination of that and then i've got hemp and tiger mix as well so i'm not going to be putting a lot in but i am going to be putting hopefully just enough for a bite now uh, recently i was out with ollie davies and we've done a, a piece down at horton and he showed just how effective these bushwhackers can be so if you haven't seen that video make sure you check it out there should be a link coming up somewhere around the top to to link you to that video but when i was out with him i did pick up a few tips on the bushwhacker as well so i'll, uh, I'll talk you through those as well in case you haven't seen the video but one of the first things worth mentioning is to actually get a few sections set up before actually shipping it out so I've set this up in section or in sets of three sections that way you haven't got to be fiddling about every single section when you're actually trying to get a rig out there so it makes it a lot quicker a lot easier and a lot more discreet as well so that's the first first point worth mentioning second point is putting the bait in first so like I said I'm not going to be using that much bait kind of a handful and a half of the the crumb and the whole boilies and then just one handful of the hemp tigers as well now by putting it in first and putting your hook bait in second that way when you drop it the hook bait is the first to drop down and that kind of minimizes the chances of hooking into any little bits of bait and masking the hook point so again it's just thinking about it and just it's common sense really but sometimes unless it's actually pointed out you might not think about it the other thing 
is I've got a storm pole here with a little rod rest on top. Now it makes it so much easier actually getting the bait out that way because you can set your rod on the rest like so, open up the bail arm and then that way you've got no line kind of, if you're doing it say from your bank sticks for example, you've got your other rods either side and there's a chance of things getting caught. But by doing it this way, it keeps the line out of the water until obviously it's past the rod tips. So I could say bait in last or hook bait in last and then just drop that in. And then if you have the, the leader coming out towards the side you're going to drop it, again there's less chance of tangles as well. So that is a few little tips that I've picked up since fishing with Ollie the other day. And then like I say doing it in the three sections makes it so much easier because otherwise I would have had to have clipped in the other two sections already. Whereas this way, it is just every free that you can ship out. So let's get this out onto that ledge and then we'll play about in the margins and try and find a couple of nice areas. And just move around this side. So it also helps if by doing it in the free sections, if you do have a bit of a crosswind, because you can ship it out a lot quicker that way. I mean it is only my second time using it so I'm a little bit rusty but even using it a couple of times you do you do pick up on things and like I say being out the other day with Ollie and seeing him use it to really good effect it definitely helps. I'll keep that going out there. Last section. I mean you can use, because I've got quite a crosswind today, you can use it to your advantage so you can just let the wind take it, take it around. So another thing that I picked up on as well is you can actually feel the drop on the lead. So if you hold the line, set that drift over a little bit, tip that, you can feel that drop down which is quite nice. So let's bring this one in. And then I shall get the margin rods out. Okay, so I'm just going to get this right hand rod out along the margin. And uh, what I'm going to do first before I start taking the rig out is I'm just going to put this storm pole in place because where I'm planning on fishing, it's quite a way around the corner. So if I have this in place, it will change to the line lay. Obviously, it will allow me to get out and around the snag. And then that way, where I'll be fishing locked up, there'll be a lot of tension as well. So if I do get a bite, there's every chance that the fish is going to take, or when it, if it does get, if I do get a bite, the fish is going to dart out rather than go against the tension. So, boy, just get this out here. I'll get it about here. That should then make a much better angle. And like I say, that way, hopefully if I do get a bite, it will cause the fish to go away from the snags rather than straight into them. grab the bait and the rig. So I'm just going to take this right rod out. I was uh, going to go a little bit further than where I'm actually going to go but I've just waded along and uh, very very silty, loads of tree roots whereas a little bit closer there was a slightly harder patch. So I'm just going to go along this margin here. Be fair, is really solid here. I think, yeah, that's been definitely feels like it's been cleaned off. So, and try and drop it down here. About three foot. That's it. That's nice and solid there. 
I'll just bring it back up, make sure there's nothing on it. Yeah, nice and clean. That's perfect. Let's put a little bit of bait over it again. Just a little bit of crumb and scattered around. And then a little bit of the hemp and tigers as well. That's ideal. I'm also being careful not to go back over the line. It. Just set the bobbin on this one and then we get the left hand rod out as well. Okay so what I'm going to do with this rod, I've tried just wading out around the front of that snag it comes out about 20 foot into the water and it's far too deep to get around the front of so I've put a storm pole in the water and I'm going to wade out, go just around it and take the pole with me so I can ship it just along the front of it and then that way by having the storm pole I'm going to obviously fish locked up and tight lines against against the pole and then hopefully with that bit of tension instead of the fish darting back against the tension if I do get a bite they go straight out so again I'm going to be using a little bit of the s core crumb just a little bit there just coat the bottom to spoon a few of the hemp and tigers some another handful and then just using a little cut down S-Core pop-up, which I'm just going to place in there. That's it, and then start taking this out. Let's take the bail arm off. And if I ship that out. So you just go around the pole and then take a couple of extra limps with me. You see that wind's really starting to pick up. So. Let's take this round. I mean, it's dropping off by this point, I can't really go much further. Bring that out, chip that along. See, this is the thing with these sort of poles, it can get you into positions that no one else is going to be fishing. So it can be a right edge. So you just drop that down there. Okay, so that's all three rods out. And uh, it's taken me a couple of hours to actually get everything sorted, but they're out. So I'm going to do a last little piece actually by the rods because obviously my right hand rod is actually quite close in the edge. So I want to have a big tidy up, get everything back a little bit. So I'm away from the water's edge. So if anything does come mooching about, don't want to be spooking it. But something I have done because I'm fishing locked up on two out of three rods, I've actually put a couple of bivy pegs in place just in front of the reels as well. So I've got the grips on the back of the, on the, on the rear rod rest, so that's gonna hold them tight. The alarms have actually got little rubber inserts as well. So again, it's gonna hold the rods tight, but just for another, another bit of protection, another um, 
bit of safety really i've put little little tent pegs just in front so if it does pull the rod a little bit then the reel's going to be hitting against the uh against the tent peg and they're nice and solid in there so no chance of any rods going which obviously you don't want and it just makes everything safer as well for if, if it, i do get a bite it makes it safer for the fish there's more chance of actually being able to get the fish out and and land it because at the end of the day fish safety is everything so yeah let's um let's see what happens i'm going to get myself set up and check in a little bit later So like I've mentioned a few times already, photography is going to be quite a big part of these vlogs going forwards uh, because we've got to talk about something whilst I'm blanking. <laughs> Can't just be putting the rods out and blanking every time. So in this little segment, we're going to be talking about what I think is five essential bits of kit for photography and videography. Now, they're essentials, but they don't have to cost the earth. So that's something to bear in mind when we are going through this. They're products that I pretty much use every time that I'm out filming. So that's why to me they're essentials and I, I couldn't see myself going out and filming or taking photos without using them at some point. So one of the first things worth mentioning is it's always worth having a decent tripod and that's, that carries through whether it's phone photography, whether you've got DSLR, mirrorless camera, even a little compact, a decent tripod is an absolute must, especially when it comes to self takes. There's no good having just a, a really cheapy tripod that is going to blow over in the wind, it's not stable, you can't adjust legs because then it's, you might as well just be leaning your camera on a bucket or something like that. So a good tripod is well recommended and you don't have to pay the earth for them. You can, for a DSLR or mirrorless camera, you can probably pick one up for about 50 quid and that would be a really good sturdy tripod. It doesn't have to be hundreds or like pushing close to a thousand pound when you're looking at carbon tripods. So something about 50 quid it's going to make the world a difference and not only with self takes but if you're doing landscapes or if you're doing long exposure photography if you get any sort of wobble on the camera where it's a bit windy then the image is just going to come out blurred so it's no good the second little product worth mentioning is one of these now probably looks a bit dodgy but it's called a rocket blower now these are really handy for when it comes to cleaning lenses or your sensor quite often you find that if your sensor gets a bit dirty you get little specks all over your photos you can't get rid of them in in photoshop but if you don't have to then obviously this will make your life a lot easier simply a case of just pushing it together and it just creates air it literally is a rubber blower um, and then this will help to dislodge anything that might be on the sensor or on your your lens and the nice thing about it is it doesn't obviously affect anything it's not like getting a cloth to it if you've got a bit of grit on it and then it end up scratching the lens or scratching the sensor this way it just blows it off without actually causing any damage you can pick these up for about fiver as well so something that's always worth having in your bag the next thing to mention is some form of lighting so where i do a lot of video and photography i use a video light um, the benefit of this is you can get them super cheap so it's not like paying hundreds for a flash I think this one cost about 20 quid and came with a couple of spare batteries and it is super bright as well. On the back of it you can actually change the brightness too so you can dim it right down if you need to and it also comes with a couple of little filters that go over it just to help diffuse the light so it's not too overpowering or too white. Um, so really handy, like I say it costs about 20 quid or something. Um, and most of these will come with a little hot shoe attachment so if you are using a proper camera then it will just attach to the top of the camera and then you can angle it as well you've got a little adjustment here now the benefit of using a video light over a flash is it makes it nice and easy to expose so i use this in my self-take photography um, and by having a constant light rather than a flash you don't have to keep flashing away trying to get the right exposure you can literally set this up and then you can expose accordingly so really handy like i said it doesn't cost the earth and it will make yourself takes a lot better. Another thing worth mentioning is if you are getting into videography, then you want decent mics. Audio is just as big a part of things as actual visual clarity and the, the quality of the lenses and the camera. If you've got really good quality lenses, really good quality camera, and the audio lets it down, a lot of people will stop watching. So there's a variety of things that you can get. I use these uh, Sennheiser mics 
and basically one of these will attach to the camera and then one of them actually attaches in person so you might see somewhere I've got the little mic and then it's just slipped into my pocket and then on that camera there's actually this bit just attached to the top so this is what both me and Curly use for our audio and it helps to produce really crystal clear audio again you don't have to be paying big money for these uh, you can get cheaper brands than Sennheiser but obviously where we're doing it on a a professional level it's got to be decent quality um, not to say that the cheaper versions won't be good they'll be so much better than if you're just using the the internal mic in the camera again you don't have to use wireless mics like that you can get a shotgun mic that will just sit on the top of the camera and again that's still going to be so much better quality audio than just the internal cam uh, the internal mic in the camera so well worth bearing that in mind and i'm sure there's probably phone alternatives as well where you can just plug it into the phone and again just give you much better audio and then the final thing worth mentioning is storage so a lot of modern cameras these days have got 25 megapixel sensors upwards and if you're shooting raw photos that takes up a lot of memory so you want storage in the camera so you want decent sized memory cards and you want storage at home as well so when it comes to editing it's well worth having that extra storage because you don't want to be on the bank see a, an awesome shot that you want to take and realize that you run out of storage I mean, my cameras that I'm using, they're the Sony a7 III. I think that's a 24 megapixel sensor. And the raw images from that is 50 megabyte per image. So if you're using a burst mode and you take 10 images, that's 500 megabytes straight away. So you want a lot of storage. Curly uses the a7R III, which is a higher resolution camera. So I think they're 46 megapixels and his raw images are about 100 meg per image. So when you actually think of it that way, the bigger the bigger the storage obviously the more images you can store um, you don't want to be left without or having to go through and delete certain images because you're trying to make room for a fish that you've caught right at the end of the session when you filled your camera so storage is key and like i say when you get home as well and you're importing all them photos it's amazing how much space they actually take up i find i can easily do 10 gigabytes of photos in uh, in a 24-hour session and that's, there's not that many photos when you actually think about it. Um, one other point actually worth mentioning um, is editing software. So when it comes to photography or video, whether it's mobile photography or you're using a DSLR or mirrorless, editing software is a big part of the process. I showed you in the previous vlog how much of a difference it can make. And it's the same with, with phone photography as well. You can really change how that image looks when it comes to editing so again you can get apps on your phone if you are into phone photography or you can get things like lightroom and photoshop if you're if you, if you are using a dslr or mirrorless camera and you're shooting raw images and that said a lot of phones actually shoot raw images as well so you can take all the images on your phone upload them when you get home and then use a, a proper bit of software to actually edit them and get the best out of them the same goes for video as well so it's all well and good taking loads of really nice clips but if you've got nothing to piece it together then they don't really mean a lot so i use premiere pro but again you can probably get cheaper apps you can get phone apps so you can create little edits on your phone so well worth looking into it and actually completing a piece rather than just doing half of it so that is i don't know how many we're up to now five or six photography tips or essentials um hopefully it's beneficial to you guys and there'll be more tips and tricks in future videos I don't really know where the time's gone if I'm honest. It's, uh, it's getting on for about seven o'clock now and I know it doesn't get dark till about nine but I'm in quite a dark swim here. You can see the sun probably just setting behind me. Um, it's not been a great deal to report. Uh, I've left the left in the middle rod exactly where I put them out first thing. Uh, the right rod I have moved. I've taken it a little bit further and similar to how I put the left rod out I did wade out a little bit with the bushwhacker and then it's just on the tip of quite a big overhanging snag big dead tree out in the water the tree that I was trying to get to the tip of which I couldn't because it ended up dropping too deep I've actually decided to to ship one out to the edge of that I just think with the like with the deeper water with the fact that it's still loads of cover for them it, it looks a much better area than than where I placed it just in the edge so that's the only change that I've made so far I've had a few liners throughout the day uh, I had quite a good liner on the left rod about half an hour ago 
Um, Bobbin kind of went about halfway and slowly dipped back down. So something must have caused that. There's something in the area, probably bream, but I'm feeling pretty confident for tonight. I've also heard that a few fish have been out since I was last up here. Um, I think there's a 29 common and a 23 mirror as well. So it's doing fish and they do seem to be coming down, coming out from down this end as well. So yeah, with, with the liners, with where I've got the rods, I'm feeling really confident for tonight. So fingers crossed, this could be the night that it happens, but I'm going to, uh, going to put the cameras away for now. Obviously if something happens overnight, then I will film it. And uh, if not, we'll have a catch up in the morning and I'll tell you about all the bream that I've probably had. But yeah, fingers crossed for tonight. Let's do it. So last night was very, very frustrating. Um, loads of activity, but once again, from completely the wrong species. I pretty much spent most of the night awake. I was having liners all night long, uh, and they were proper liners as well. It wasn't just the odd beep here and there. It was five, six beeps, and it had me running the rods on multiple occasions. Uh, during the night, I did end up with two tench and two bream. So along with all the liners and having to weighed out, we shipped the rods back out and all sorts. Um, yeah, it was a pretty frustrating night with not a lot of sleep and not for the right reasons either. Got all the rods back out now. They're all, all back out on the spots, hopefully, perfectly, but it doesn't seem to do many day bites at all from, uh, from all accounts. So I'm not holding out too much hope for the last few hours. Uh, it's hard because you go into each night feeling really confident and especially last night I was thinking, I was in, in the right area, rigs were bang on, it wasn't a great deal of disturbance once they, once they were out, uh, kept everything away from the water's edge and it felt really good for a bite and like I say it was just bream and br like bream after bream, tench after tench and then in, in uh, result of that it obviously had me going back into the water causing disturbance throughout the whole night so any fish that were in the area were probably long gone by that point. So I think I need to work on a new approach because uh, what I'm doing, although it's getting bites, it's not getting bites from the right, uh, right species at all. So I'm going to go back to the drawing board and kind of reassess my options. And if I need to start using bigger baits, which I think is kind of heading that way, then I'm going to have to do that. The reason I haven't so far is obviously smaller baits will normally outfish bigger baits. But when I'm getting played with bream and tench all night and it's actually disturbing the swim, it's, it's not it's not beneficial at all so next time I'm down here I think I'm gonna have to have to end up using bigger baits and hopefully fend off them bream and tench because it's not even like it's big bream that are taking the bait or big tench bream are about four or five pound each and the tench are about three pounds so if I can if I can work out a way of, of just using bigger baits and then I'm gonna have to and that might withstand them nuisance kind of species but yeah, like I say, very frustrating. Um, I've got a few hours left and since, pretty much since it's been light, there's been next to no activity whatsoever. So it's a good thing there's been no activity from the bream or tench, but obviously that means that there's no activity from the carp either. So I've just, just got to see how these last few hours go. It did drop down very, very cold last night as well. Um, the field opposite me when I was awake at maybe five-ish, just on first light, completely frosted over so it's still very cold nights and warm days I was looking at the weather and it's kind of 16 degrees in the day but it's dropping down to one at night and then obviously in the middle of nowhere that seems to be even colder than that as well so yeah it's uh it's tough going it's definitely a challenge up here um but I have heard that a, a couple more fish have been out I think I said that yesterday actually a, a 29 common and a 23 mirror has been out so the lake is producing but it's just getting past all the nuisance species to, to be in with a shout. So, yeah, I mean, hopefully during this vlog or during this month, I'll be able to get down and do another session, but 
work is very, very busy at the moment. Obviously, with nights being allowed, we're out filming a lot. So trying to find time to, to do these and to get more than one night in isn't easy. But this, this isn't the end of the vlog. I am going to make sure that I definitely get a day down at the other water that I mentioned, which is a much better bites water. So hopefully I can show you a little bit about the um, like self-take photography, phone photography, because that's going to be the ideal venue for that. So yeah, it's not over yet, but if I can squeeze another night in, then I will do. If not, then I'll see you down at the little lake and, and give you a few photography tips. Okay, so self-takes is what we're going to be looking at in this month's vlog in terms of photography tips and in the previous vlog in the comments we had a lot of comments um, asking for help with self-takes so hopefully I'm going to give you a few a few little pointers that's going to make self-takes a lot easier for you. Now I've tried to do this piece a couple of times already and uh, I haven't caught anything so hence why we've got Doris here to help out um, because this way obviously it so a little bit less pressure, don't have to catch anything, but I also have a bit more time to explain things. So I haven't got to worry about uh, actually having a fish on the bank and trying to rush through everything. So yeah, that is, uh, that's what we're going to be talking about. So I'm going to put Doris down and uh, we'll start going into a little bit about the equipment used. Okay, so one of the first things you want to think about in terms of equipment is what lens you're going to use. So obviously you get various focal lengths. Uh, a lot of you might have a kit lens, so it's a, a range between 18 and 55 mil. Um, some of you might have prime lenses as well or be looking to expand your kit. So for me, I always use either a 35 mil, which is actually on the camera that I'm talking to, or a 50 mil. Um, basically this is a nice, uh, it's a nice focal length where it doesn't distort the fish too much in terms of uh, like lens distortion. So if you were to use a, a 24 mil lens on a full frame camera, you get quite a bit of lens distortion um, and the fish will look a lot bigger than it actually is which uh, with the size of fish I catch it probably wouldn't be a bad thing but I'd rather than look exactly how they actually are. With either a 35 or a 50 mil like I say it's a lot more a lot more lifelike. Um, depends on the size of the fish as to what lens I use most of the time I do use a 35 mil um, again this is talking on full frame cameras but sometimes if it's a slightly bigger fish or if I've got a little bit more room in the swim, then I will use the 50 mil. Um, just gives a slightly different look to the photo. It will help blur out the background that little bit more, even at the same apertures as 35 mil. Um, but like I say, it does very much depend on, on the situation, how much room I've got and what kind of look I'm going for. Um, if you start using things like 85 mil or 100 mil lenses, it will really isolate the subject but at the same time, it does make the fish look smaller than they actually are. So a 50 mil lens, uh, sorry, a 35 mil lens on a full frame camera is the closest you, you will get to actually what you see, which is why I use that most of the time. Um, if we're talking about crop sensors, obviously you have got that crop to think about. So a 20, 24 mil lens will be a lot closer to what 35 mil is on full frame cameras. Um, so I'd, if I had a crop sensor and I was looking for a prime, I'd be looking either 24 to 35 mil um, with quite a nice wide aperture. So something you can stop down a little bit um, so you can get that nice blur out of it as well. So again, you're isolating the subject. So what I do is I'll, I'll put a few images in as examples and I'll put the focal length uh, next to them so you can see how they look different in, in each image. So I'll make sure that it's actually framed the same for each lens, but you'll see how different the background blur will look and the actual distortion, so how the size of the fish changes through various focal lengths. So it's, um, it's something that you might not think about, but when you actually see it, it's, it can be quite obvious at times. So if I do one with the 24 mil, 35, 50 and 100 mil as well, so you will see a, a big difference between all of those. Moving on from lenses, uh, obviously this is more about night self takes. And I've already talked about this, this is the video light. So this is why I use, you can use flashes as well, but I find a video, video light a little bit easier in terms of getting the exposure right because it's a constant light rather than just flashing constantly to, to tweak it. So something like this, nice and cheap off Amazon. You can get them for about 20, 25 quid. Uh, and they're actually really powerful and the batteries last ages as well. So I can't remember the last time I actually charged my batteries, 
but that's probably because I haven't caught many fish lately. Um, the next thing, obviously a decent tripod. Now this is a little bit overkill for a lot of cameras. It's quite, obviously quite hefty, um, but a decent tripod and a decent head on the tripod is, is really beneficial as well because the nice thing with a head like this, obviously you've got a lot of movement and you can go side to side. But if you wanted to take some portrait photos as well as landscape, it does allow you to do that nice and easily instead of having to try and rig the camera up somehow. You've got everything you need and you've got little spirit bubbles and things like that all over the tripod so you can get everything bang, bang level how it should be. Okay, so the next thing that's gonna make your self takes a lot easier is an interval timer. All cameras have got a certain timer so you can set it as 10 seconds, run around, pick up the fish and I hope that you get the shot but obviously with an interval timer, it's gonna be a lot easier. So some cameras have got them built in. So on mine, I've got it here. And then basically you can go into it, turn it on, and then you can set all the options here. So I've got a five second delay before it actually starts taking shots. And then basically it will take a shot every two seconds until I tell it to stop. I've got it set as 9,000 shots, uh, which will take four hours and 59 minutes. Uh, obviously you're not going to be holding a fish up for 4 hours 59 minutes but I'd rather set it like that and it will just take shots until I tell it to stop. So that is how simple they are to use. Once you've got it on I'll just press it. There you go, you've got your 5 second delay and then it will start shooting. There's the first shot and then every 2 seconds it will take another shot. And then press the shutter button again and it will stop. Now if your camera doesn't have an interval timer built into it you can get something called an intervalometer. Uh, and this works in a very similar way. It's basically something that will just plug into one of the side little flaps of your camera, and then you set it up in exactly the same way. So the same sort of product that's used for time-lapse photography, um, because that's obviously what interval, uh, what interval timers are originally made for. Um, so you can, you can set it to take a photo every however many seconds and then put it all together, and then you've got obviously a moving time-lapse. But for, um, for self-take photography, they're also very, very useful. Okay, so the next thing to think about is framing. Uh, now, the easiest way I think to do this is to have the mat obviously central to the camera and allow a bit of space around the side. So if you've got maybe 10, 15 centimeters within the frame of the mat either side, then you know that that fish is gonna be uh, within the shot. You're not gonna get the tail cut off or anything like that. Now, once you've done that and you can, you can see through your viewfinder or through the screen that everything is in shot, then I normally tilt the camera back up. Um, so then the mat is away from the shot or out of the shot, should I say, out of the frame. Um, but you know that that way, everything's gonna be centered. You've got room around the fish because that's something to bear in mind as well. You wanna make sure that you've got a bit of space you can crop in if you need to, because you're far better having that space around the fish and then being able to crop and make sure it is exactly centered, then you are shooting it too tight, and not being able to do anything with it. So once you've done that, once you've got it all centered and you've got room around it, obviously it should fill the frame nicely, but like I say, you should still have enough room around the fish, top and bottom to crop in if needed. Now something else when it comes to actually framing the shot, is you want to pick a nice background so something like i've got behind me um, it's not too uh, different in terms of light levels it's pretty uniformed all the way across the back i know we've got the odd flower coming up but it's quite nice to expose against if you're exposing somewhere where you've got um, sunlight coming through trees and it's all dappled light it just doesn't look right so you want to pick somewhere that's quite flat quite neutral and you've got similar light amongst the whole uh, the whole scene Obviously, the other thing to bear in mind is you don't want to be doing uh, self-take when you've got a big bright sky behind you because you're going to be very dark um, and the sky's going to be very bright. So exposing that is going to be pretty, pretty challenging really and you're not going to get the best possible shot that you want. Basically, you want the light on you um, so everything is nice and flat and you've got a background which is almost going to stay pretty neutral like I've said. So. That's, um, that's the basics when it comes to framing. Okay, so the next thing to talk about is gonna be the settings. Uh, it's hard to say exactly what settings to use because obviously every situation is gonna be different in terms of light levels, uh, backgrounds, and all sorts really. But something I do pretty much do every time uh, I'm doing self-takes 
is I'll have the aperture around 3.2. That way it gives a nice amount of background blur, but again, it still allows a good portion of the shot to be in focus. Now that makes it a lot easier, obviously if you are doing self-takes, to have that slightly bigger window than uh, stopping it down to something like 1.4 and having just a really thin slice of focus. So 3.2 gives you that nice balance between a, a decent chunk of focus and a nice blur on the background as well. Now, sometimes what I do is you'll see around the top here, it is quite overexposed. So even though it's showing zero on the, on the light meter, by having it a bit overexposed, it's gonna be hard to bring that detail back. So you're better off just kind of upping the shutter speed a little bit. So it's a little bit darker on the actual frame, but it does bring a bit of detail back here because it's far easier to raise the shadows up than it is to drop highlights when it comes to editing. Now, the other thing I do try and do is I do try and have my shutter speed at about one to hundred. That way it eliminates any slight movement. So if you're shooting at a, a slower shutter speed, if you get a little bit of movement from the fish or you kind of wobble a little bit yourself, then it can create a little bit of movement in the photo. So it's not gonna be as sharp as what it can be. Other than that, ISO, I try and keep as low as possible, but also if I do need to bump it up, then I will do. Um, again, the full frame camera is quite good at handling um, higher ISOs than, than what crop sensors are. So if possible during the day, I always try and keep one 200th of a second and then F3.2 for the aperture. Other than that, it's pretty much good to go. Like I said earlier, I've got the interval shooting on. It says autofocus there, but I am actually using manual focus as a switch on the lens, which overrides uh, the camera's autofocus uh, or the camera's ability to auto autofocus. Um, so once I've got it to that point, I will angle that, make sure everything's roughly in shot, sort the focus out, which I will talk to you in a bit about how I go about that. It's something like that is about, about bang on bring it back up so you've got just the bottom of the mat and then if I start the camera obviously you've got the five second countdown so if I go round pick up Doris then that should be about right Now, if you look at that image, obviously it looks a bit dark, but like I said, you're better off having it that way, having it a little bit dark in the actual main image, but with a bit of detail in the highlights because that can easily be brought back and the shadows can be raised up. So overall, in terms of framing and in terms of sharpness and exposure, that's looking all right. Obviously, it'd look much better if it's a real fish. But I will show you the, uh, I will put some of the finished edits in afterwards so you can see the example. And this is actually shot on the 35mm lens. So, like I say, that's the most lifelike when it comes to full frame sensors. Okay, so the next part to talk about is uh, focusing. And this is probably the bit that can be the trickiest, depending on what camera setup you've got. Um, some cameras allow you with an interval timer to autofocus between every single shot. Now, if your camera allows you to do that, I think Canons do mostly, um, then it makes life a lot easier. Uh, that way you can just choose a, a central autofocus point or a, a central cluster. And then that way, when you hold the fish up, obviously it's gonna be center of the frame and it will focus on the fish rather than on something in the background. So then everything in the foreground is out of focus. Um, Something to bear in mind though, is if you are using autofocus, turn off the eye autofocus, um, because that seems to catch quite a few people out where even though you're using the central focusing cluster or the, the cluster of points in the center, by having the eye autofocus on, that will take priority over where your focus points are. So even though it's cent central, it's gonna be picking up your eye and focusing on that, which is then gonna mean that the fish is blurred and out of focus. So always worth bearing in mind that if you are doing autofocus. Um, if you've got a Sony, then they don't seem to allow you to focus between shots um, using the interval timer, unless someone can prove, 
prove me otherwise, which I hope you can because it would make life a lot easier. Uh, so the thing to do with Sony's is to use manual focus. Um, and that's what I've been doing since I've changed to Sony. Uh, and it's, it's easier on Sony's to manual focus than it is um, Canons or certainly older Canons because Sony's have got something called focus peaking. So basically it shows up everything in focus um, or everything that is in focus as either red, yellow or green, I think is the other color. Um, so that way it makes it nice and easy to, to manual focus. And then it's just a case of actually focusing on the right thing because you're not round the other side of the camera for it to focus on you. So the, there's a couple of ways to do this. What I generally do is I found by angling the camera down, zooming into the actual frame itself, you can then focus nice and accurately. And I basically use a sling um, before I've got the fish out of the water or anything like that, I'll put the sling and I'll use the um, the floats as the kind of centre of the mat. So the lens floats will run right along the centre of the mat and then you can focus on them because you know that when the fish is in the mat, when you come to hold it up, if you hold the fish roughly centred uh, in the mat, then the fish is going to be in focus. So that seems to work pretty well for self-takes on the hull. The other thing you can do as well once you've done once you have focused it to that point is when it comes to actually taking the, the shots of the fish is you can take a few shots where you think is centered, move forward, take a few shots, move backwards, take a few shots. And then at some point out of them shots, a few of them will be in focus depending where your focus plane is. So that's one way of doing it. Like I say, zooming in uh, and then angling it back up once you have focused, once everything is shown as, or once a, the center is shown as red the other way of doing it is to take the camera off the rest or off the tripod come around with the camera and then you can zoom in this way instead focus on the head of the tripod holding the camera where you'd be holding the fish so then that way the distance between the camera and the tripod is the same both ways not sure how to explain that easiest but basically once this is in, once this is focused on the tripod head when you move it back around it's going to be focused where you're going to be holding the fish i think that makes sense so a couple of different options there and then once you've done it once you've got everything set up and ready then you can go and get the fish out and uh, everything should be ready to go Okay, so then the final thing to talk about is self-takes for a phone. Now, there's various ways of doing this again. Uh, I've picked up a cheap phone tripod off Amazon. I think it was about six quid. And it's basically like a fake version of a Gorillapod. So it will grab onto anything. I've obviously got it here on my chair. Uh, and to be honest, it's maybe slightly too high. You might be better off with a couple of buckets and then just using it as a normal tripod or... Um, yeah, it's just a, a case of playing around a little bit and seeing seeing what seems best. Um, but yeah, cam uh, self self takes on on phones are pretty straightforward. Um, a couple of different ways of doing it on Samsungs, like I've got, you can actually set voice commands. So you can say something like capture or shoot, and that will actually take a photo for you. Um, if you don't have a Samsung, I'm not sure about iPhones or other phones, whether they have voice commands like that, but there is an app called Whistle. Uh, and basically you can whistle and then it will take a photo after that. So I'll show you on my one using, just using the Samsung camera. So that's all set up, ready to go. <coughs> so there's, obviously with phones, pretty much everything's in focus as well. So uh, they're all auto focused. So you don't need to worry about tweaking any settings too much. Um, so if I say capture, then that should take a photo. So now coming back, there you go. It's got a photo there. Uh, again, you can crop into it if needed. Um, you can obviously spend a little bit more time actually setting up for getting your framing right. Um, this was just a very quick, quick example to show just how easy it can be using a phone as well. Okay, so there you go. That is a load of information about self-take photography. So hopefully it's gonna be of use to you. And even if you don't use all of it, you might be able to take one or two aspects from it, little uh, hinters or little tips and 
that sort of thing that might be, might become useful for you. So yeah, fingers crossed um, you will be on the bank soon and uh, you'll be able to put it to use. But that's, uh, that's going to be the end of the vlog for, for now. Uh, I'm itching to get back up here. So thanks for watching again and uh, fingers crossed next time we have something. It's, um, it's getting better and better every time. So I reckon we might in the next, in the next vlog. But uh, for now, like I say, thanks for watching. If you do like this sort of content, make sure you subscribe to Carpology on YouTube and uh, follow us on all our various social media platforms. Yeah, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next vlog.